So this is uh, lecture number seven. Welcome to it. Um, we are continuing our discussion on fractures as part of the um, section on brittle deformation. And um, as I just mentioned, um, we will continue next time on Tuesday with uh, folds. And then we have a little test. And um, then we'll discuss about the ductile uh, regime and the plastic deformation mechanisms. And uh, we'll have another test. And then in the second part of the, of the course, we'll have really interesting things discussing the, um, the structure of the planet and uh, discussing the uh, uh, plate tectonic theory and uh, uh, the processes of orogenesis. So this will be more interesting. But we are uh, putting the foundations here uh, for some terminology and some of the um, observations that we can make uh, regarding the formation of the rocks. So we'll continue discussing about, about joints today and then uh, something called the formation bands. And we'll have a very brief, very, very brief at the end introduction uh, regarding the faults, yeah, just the definitions. So if you remember this time, uh, last time we, we looked at these things, it's just a little review uh, when we discuss about fractures, yeah? So here we talk about uh, brittle deformation, so the formation of discontinuities in the volumes of rocks. Um, so surfaces along which the rock loses cohesion. Uh, that's what happens. And uh, when we classify the fractures, we talked about shear fractures, where the relative movement is parallel to, to, to the fracture. Uh, and it's small. We call them shear fractures if the, if the slip, the movement is uh, small. It's like centimeters to a uh, few tens of centimeters. Uh, if it's more, then we call them folds. And we'll discuss about folds. Yeah? Um, and also we discussed about extension fractures that open perpendicular. Uh, the gap is perpendicular to, to the plane of the fractures. Um, and we have some of these extension fractures called joints where the actual displacement opening is very small. Yeah, very small. Uh, usually microscopically it's little or you might not even uh, be able to see it. But in many cases you see it. Um, and as I said, what you call joint and what you call fissure doesn't have an exact uh, boundary. It doesn't have a, say, let's say if it's more than five centimeters, it's a fissure or so. It's in the context of the uh, location where you look. Um, I've shown you an example, like what the joints are looking and something you would call a fissure there. Yeah? It was like wider and so on. And if it's uh, filled with air, yeah, with air or with water, we call, call them fissure. If they are uh, filled with minerals that precipitated there, and primarily it's calcite or quartz, we call them uh, veins. Uh, and if they are uh, filled with uh, a rock that uh, comes from the solidification of a magma, then we call them dikes, yeah? so. This is the terminology. Now, the idea is that you have to imagine in terms of the state of stress that causes these fractures. Yeah. So when we talk about extension fractures, yeah, the extension fractures, uh, the opening is perpendicular to the fracture, so is along along the direction of the sigma three. Yeah, sigma three being the the uh, smallest principal stress. So you can see in the more space, again, coming back to the more space, you can see we discuss about the failure criteria that provide these failure envelopes that we call them in the ca case of the tensile regime, which is to the left of the vertical axis here. This is a tensile regime. In this case, the Griffith criterion works in general well. Uh, to the right, we have we can have different criteria. You've seen Coulomb, uh, in some cases, Gravit, or something that we call more, yeah? 
which depends on the rock. Um, and the idea is that to have the, the actual extension fractures, yeah, uh, the extension fractures where, um, uh, which are perpendicular to the direction of sigma three, uh, in the more space, you have to have this situation, yeah, this situation. Um, and you see in the representation of the state of stress, what happens, you have basically you reach the uh, critical state and that's where the openings are. So these are the joints. Now, you can imagine that you have such a state of stress that you see the Mohr circle touching in between, you know, uh, the pure tensile uh, fractures and uh, the compressive regime. This is something like hybrid fractures, yeah, or hybrid fractures. Um, and what happens here, the fractures are no longer uh, perpendicular to sigma three. They are inclined, yeah, they are inclined, and um, they tend to have to be conjugate like uh, like this um, with a certain angle. And then you have, you see, depending on the differential stress, you see here, you have a small differential stress so that the circle touches, uh, reaches here. But if it's a larger differential stress, uh, it's not going to touch right here. So that's why you have the development of these hybrid fractures. Now, if it's an even larger differential stress, like here, you see, you have the formation of shear fractures. Yeah. So we are in the compressive regime and you, know, you form this shear fracture. So this is just to clarify, we have this continuum yeah, from the extension fractures to shear fractures. You can imagine the geologic environment is very, very uh, complex. Yeah? Um, so here, just to remind you what, what the joints uh, look like. So you, we have here an image from a country very far from uh, from us, uh, it's Kazakhstan uh, in Central Asia. And Kazakhstan uh, has this uh, region that it's called the Kazakh uplands, yeah? And you can see here, for instance, in the foreground, you can see the horizontal joints, yeah, horizontal joints. And uh, we can have a mechanism, how would they form? And we'll see in a bit, yeah, how would they, this form? Uh, now, in the background, you have these cerros, yeah, you have these uh, mountains that you can see. And here you can see different joints like these ones, for instance, you can see them very clearly yeah, uh, here, like vertical, they look to me, these joints. Um, and probably you'll have some other joints uh, that you can see here and here and here, horizontal um, also here. Uh, so. The idea is that these joints have different orientations, but these orientations tell us something about the local state of stress. Yeah, that's the idea. So when we think, why would they, the joints be important? There are people who go and measure systematically, they measure uh, the orientations of the joints and so on. So think about this, they reveal the paleo stress. Paleo stress means the state of stress that existed when they formed. Now, the state of stress might be different. And also when you see different joints, yeah, different joints that affect the volume of rock, that doesn't mean that they all formed at the same time. So the, the state of stress changed. So we can understand the history. So I hope, I hope that you, uh, you see now that we have to learn these aspects, which are kind of drier about the stress, about the strain, all these things. But we need these elements to be able, if we become structural geologists, to be able to reconstruct the history of a certain region. And this is what geologists do in the end. Yeah. So even if you are not specialized in structural geology and you are a, a general uh, geology guy or a mapping person like you, you you go and map and so on. You have to understand what is the structural geology because eventually your interpretation of what you see in the field is going to help our people unravel, like, like uh, find the evolution and the, the history, yeah? the geologic history. So paleo stress is important. Now think also about this fact, enhancing permeability. So 
once you have these joints, fluids can penetrate along them. So, so the enhanced permeability could be good in the, for those who are interested in, in uh, reaching uh, certain fluids like oil, gas, or water, yeah? like uh, uh, the aquifers. Now, also, they are conduits for magma, yeah? so they are like, so important in a geologic sense. Uh, that that they they allow magma to uh, go through the crust, and also from a, an engineering point of view, think about this: they weaken a volume of rock because, as we discussed, when we talked about the sliding criteria, yeah, the sliding criteria. Once you have a plane of discontinuity, that is a plane of weakness, and with a favorable orientation relative to the state of stress at a certain point in the geologic history, that plane of weakness can be reactivated and uh, displacement can occur along it. Yeah, So they weaken the rocks. So this is concerning for us. Uh, as I just mentioned, they can reactivate as faults. Also, engineering, from an engineering point of view, they reduce the slope stability. So if the bedrock has many joints, it, they reduce the slow sl stability, yeah. So they can uh, lead to rock falls. Also, when we have this type of infrastructure works like tunnels, yeah, tunnels, or when a road is built and we we blast sections to construct the road, the joints will control actually uh, this um, blasting in the end. Um, so. You see, and other things, control erosion and surface topography. So actually they are important in the sense that they condition the situation at the surface for various engineering purposes. So that's why uh, it is important uh, to understand them. Now, let's talk a bit about something that you will encounter. Uh, we can talk about systematic joints and non-systematic, yeah? So systematic means that they are systematic. There is an order. They are pl planar, like planes, and they are like a set or a, a family, yeah? They, they, they are all parallel, yeah? In general, parallel or sub-parallel, they are parallel. And roughly, they occur at a certain spacing. So these are called systematic joints because there is a certain order to this. Yeah. Now the ones that you know kind of are irregularly distributed in space, they don't come uh, you know in a systematic manner. We call them non-systematic. And this diagram shows you yeah what would be systematic. You see the ones parallel like this, and some non-systematic joints in between um, that. Uh, they tend in many cases to be non-planar, yeah? So curved surface and so on. Now, let's have a look at this outcrop. So this is a sequence which repeats across. Yes, it can repeat ac across the layers. Yeah, joints can occur in a certain layer or a certain group of layers or across many, uh, definitely, yes. Uh, the state of stress and the mechanical properties of rocks uh, determine uh, how many layers in a sequence would be affected by fracturing. So the idea is, look at this. Uh, this is a Cambrian sandstone. Yeah, Cambrian uh, is the earliest uh, period of the Paleozoic. And uh, if you look here, they, they say three sets of systematic joints controlling erosion. So let's see what, what it means by, by this. You see here a geologic hammer, so you understand the scale. So three sets. One of them is like this, yeah? You see them parallel like this. I can see it, yeah? Okay, now there is another one which is kind of perpendicular to this one, uh, a second set. You see it here, yeah? Then you see some that are diagonal. Now, they said three, so I guess they, they thought about these ones, the per ones perpendicular and these ones that you can see very nicely like this, yeah? So this is another uh, set of systematic joints. But I guess, because you cannot see very well in this image, there is a fourth one which is perpendicular to these diagonal ones, which I think it's this one and I can uh, imagine there is another one here. So 
uh, I tend to think there is a fourth one, but obviously there are three here. Yeah. So you can see, and how, how do they control erosion? Obviously, the erosion will be intensified yeah, along these planes of weakness, yeah, because um, the agents of erosion, like water, for instance, can penetrate. And actually, they focus, the erosion is focused in this, <laughs> these uh, little valleys that uh, get more and more enhanced. All right. So that's something of the terminology. I think it's easy to understand. And you'll see them when you go in the field, you will have a trained eye. And now you'll be able to spot them, yeah, to, to see these joints. Now, a bit of rock mechanics uh, again. Teacher, sorry, may I ask you a question before you Yes, continue? David. Yes, David. So in the last uh, diapositiva, could we say that non-systematic joints are caused or are a product of systematic ones? No, no, no. They have no relationship. Yeah. No the really idea is in a in a in a volume of rock, yeah, you can have it can be affected by systematic joints, so fractures that uh, sets of fractures that form more or less at the same uh, time or due to the same state of stress, and they, there is a certain spacing to them. They are, they come like regularly, and then you can have joints like fractures that affected the rock at some other time in a different state of stress. And that they don't come as a set, yeah? They are not related to the others and cut without a certain rule, yeah, uh, in this volume. So okay. it's not a, a relationship. The idea okay. is, uh, you are welcome, David. The idea is, and this is important, keep always in mind for your future as geoscientists, that when you look at a volume of rock, you look, both in space, three-dimensionally, I, I try to understand, but also in time. And you, you have here many events that, that uh, happened in time, yeah? So they are not all simultaneous. We see them at the same time now that they exist, like, you know, witnesses of something that happened in the past, but we have to understand when it happened relative to the other and so on. So this is important in geology. Anyway, you are welcome, uh, David. So. Talking about the uh, formation of joints, yeah? So pure joints, pure joints require tensile, tensile um, stress, yeah? You have to get here. Now, how do you get here? We talked last time, you remember I talked, told you that in most cases, except for the very, uh, the region very close to the surface of the earth, and I'll show you in a bit. So except for this situation, in most cases, there is something that causes a, an increase in the pressure of the fluid that exists in the pores, in the opening of the rocks, in the micro cracks, the Griffith micro cracks. So the increase in the pressure counteracts the actual stress that exists at the uh, you know, uh, boundaries of the various grains of rock. So the, there is an effective stress which in the more space translates into this movement to the left, as you see, of the more circle. So let's say initially, yeah, when uh, you had a certain pressure of the fluid, this was the state of stress, and then the increase in pressure leads to this. And by, by, by this uh, change of the effective stress, this is the stress that the rock feels, yeah? So the effective means what does the rock feel yeah, in the end? What's the resultant? Um, as a result of this, uh, it, the, the, state, uh, the, the state of stress can be such that it, it gets unstable at this point yeah, of the stability uh, field margin defined by this curve. And this is where joints form. Yeah. Now, uh, it, what it says here, joint formation requires tensile effective stress and low differential stress. So one condition was to reach here, but to reach here, you need the differential stress. Yeah, this, the diameter of the Mohr circle. So the difference between sigma one and sigma three to be relatively small so that it can fit in here. If it's not small, 
you are not going to touch this part of the uh, stability field, yeah, of the margin of the stability field. So you will create shear fractures, yeah? So uh, joints can form or shear fractures can form, depending uh, on the differential stress, yeah? So that's why I, I'm bringing your attention to this, to our understanding, mechanical understanding of the stress conditions, yeah, which lead to either joints or shear fractures. Yeah, so here is a slide with text, basically. Uh, so uh, when we talk about extension fractures, extension fractures, now, so we talk about these ones here, yeah? We can divide them in two. We can say hydro fractures, hydro fractures. And this is a case, uh, basically the situation shown here, increase in the pressure of the, of the fluid by whatever cause, yeah, the increase leads to hydrofracturing. And this is um, the situation deeper in the crust, yeah? This is what causes the formation of joints deeper in the crust. And I'll, we'll discuss in a bit why. Uh, what can lead to the elevated fluid pressures? Um, but also they can form not with the increase of the the um, uh, you know fluid pressure they you can have an actual tensile stress situation at very shallow depths yeah very shallow depths we talk about hundreds of meters um and i'll show you why yeah in a bit we'll discuss about this all right so here is some situations that lead to the formation of joints yeah so let's let's look at them uh, this is a situation I was saying at depth, yeah, in many instances, uh, the, the, that we call hydrofracturing. So you, you imagine a volume of rock gets buried, yeah, gets buried, and later in its geologic history, there is something that causes an increase in the pressure of the fluid, and you get to that situation. But you can have this situation, yeah, the, the formation of a, of a, a layer. Now, what that layer could be, here, this situation is kind of detailed here. You can have something, a process called buckling of a layer of rocks, let's say a kappa, yeah? And uh, this is how you form a fold. But you can imagine your intuition of what will happen is on this outer arc, on this outer arc, the deformation will be accommodated if we are not, uh, uh, let's say in, in the, total plastic regime, the deformation would be accommodated by brittle deformation here, by the formation of these fractures, yeah? So this would be outer arc extension. Now, at a different scale, imagine this could be the layer, yeah, a layer, a sedimentary layer, you know about those. But imagine that we can talk about the entire crust, yeah? The entire crust. And when we talk about uh, processes, uh, tectonic processes, we can have something called doming. Now, imagine in the crust, imagine a big magma chamber, yeah, like the, the uh, formation, yeah, the ascent of a, uh, a large volume of magma. And this can create a doming, yeah, a doming uh, of the part of the crust above it. And the, the crust would suffer this type of outer arc extension. So you would have formation of joints due to this process. Now, when we talk about orogenesis, orogenesis, uh, we'll, uh, we'll mention this situation where a plateau is formed. The most famous plateau that, uh, that uh, you definitely learned, uh, heard, heard about it is the Tibetan plateau, yeah? Behind the Himalayas. But we have such plateaus in the Andes as well, yeah? So that's, that's the idea, yeah, the uh, altiplanos in the Andes. So the plateau up, uplift, yeah, as a result of orogenic processes, you can see it can create such situation for the formation of joints. Now, all these situations, yeah, are tectonic, yeah, their origin is tectonic, yeah, in the end. So uh, we can call them tectonic joints. Um, and I'll show you another situation of tectonic joints. Now, when we were talking about the joints that can form 
closer to the surface, for instance, uh, there is something called exfoliation. Exfoliation. Uh, so this imagine the rock is the rock is kind of uh, buried. A volume of rock is buried. So there is a, a load on top of it. But if it gets uplifted as a result of the geologic evolution, it gets uplifted. Uh, what happens? The regional horizontal stress could be, um, you know, uh, the same, could stay the same. But the actual vertical stress, which would be sigma three, decreases, decreases. And then there is this longitudinal splitting, yeah, basically the formation of joints that are horizontal yeah, along the direction of sigma one, as we saw in experiments and we discussed last time. So you would have these joints parallel to the ground. You, you remember you've seen such joints in the image from Kazakhstan, for instance. And then we also have some a process called cooling. So cooling can be, can be imagine that you have the, um, uh, you know, a volume of lava that cools fast. And then you have thermal contraction and the formation, this phenomenon is quite spectacular, the formation of these columnar joints associated with this uh, basaltic lava flows, for instance. I'll show you an example, yeah? Or you can, have a, you can have a volume of rock that through exhumation, which means uplift, let's say through erosion, it gets So deeper is warmer as it gets slowly uh, closer and closer to the surface, uh, its temperature, yeah, the temperature changes. So it, it suffers thermal contraction. So basically, inside the volume, there are tensile stresses, yeah, through the contraction of the volume, and these joints are created, yeah. So you can see now processes that make sense and lead to the creation of joints. Now, here I talk about tectonic joints, yeah, tectonic joints. Uh, this was a typical example of tectonic joints, what you have here, yeah. Uh, they are in response to tectonic stresses. Yeah, the tectonic can be stress can be regional from the margin of the plates or local due to the, uh, uh, you know, local is in the case of, let's say when we talk about the formation of a fold, yeah, the local situation. Now, when we talk about the formation of the uh, orogenic plateau, then of course we talk about the regional stress, yeah? So this is what happens. Now, I'm saying here, joints, tectonic joints can also form as a result of regional deformation uh, due to elevated pore fluid pressure. So imagine what happens. We will discuss about this when we talk about the origins, but the origins have two parts, uh, two sides, yeah? One we call uh, foreland, which is the continental interior. So you see these origins, for instance, if they form at the margin of a continent, like the Andes, the part that goes towards, uh, from Villa Vicencio towards Venezuela, for instance, yeah? This part is called the foreland for the Andean origin. And the same from Chile to Argentina. So from the range on, on the Argentinian side, as you go towards the Atlantic, that's a foreland, yeah? And the, on the other side of the origin is called hinterland. And we will discuss about these terms when we discuss about the origins. But what happens, imagine, in this foreland, due to the regional, regional stress, yeah? So the fluids that exist in the layers in the foreland might become overpressured because of this, you know, very serious regional stress. And this over uh, pressure conditions lead to the formation of joints in the layers and in the rocks in front of the origin. Yeah. So this is an example. Yeah. It's an example just to give you um, uh, an example. Now here it's a, an image. Yeah. It's an image. Uh, and here, what you see here, you see two types of joints. You see these joints like this curved here. And here, imagine you have an onion and you peel it, yeah, cebola. Uh, so the, the idea is that those are exfoliation joints, and you've seen uh, you've seen him uh, mentioned here. I'll show you in a bit. 
but this one that you see here this is a joint and it's a, a non-systematic joint it's just one i i can see here yeah it's just one this one and i can see another one here yeah i can see these are for for sure tectonic joints there was something yeah a state of stress which was local or regional that caused this yeah that's the idea so um these are the tectonic joints now let's talk a bit about this exfoliation or sheet joints yeah so as i mentioned imagine through erosion a volume of rock gets closer and closer to the surface yeah and as it gets closer to the surface the vertical stress yeah is relieved yeah this for you know for this piece that was here as it gets closer to the surface uh, sigma 3 here would be less yeah uh, sigma 1 is not reduced you can have the original stress so what happens at some point joints will form yeah that you'll get to such a condition that the joints will form parallel yeah uh, there is uh, the same thing can happen uh, very typical with the uh, with the erosion of terrains that contain granitic plutons now uh, plutons are igneous bodies yeah so there was a magma uh, that had solidified uh, at depth and there is a very typical uh, very famous type of rock called granite now some of you did not study yet petrology you studied mineralogy but you didn't study petrology now the granites typically have quartz they have quartz uh, uh, and they have uh, potassium uh, feldspar potassium feldspar uh, or a so uh, sodic feldspar and calcium feldspars yeah so they have plagioclase uh, feldspars and they have alkaline feldspars like potassium and uh, sodium feldspars. So this is a typical grind. And sometimes uh, in most grinds, you'll see some dark minerals, could be an amphibole, could, could, be, uh, could be biotite. They can also have uh, muscovite. But granite is, you know, uh, a rock that is a, a very typical rock for continents yeah so you have plutons you have plutons so the idea is when they get exposed yeah and eroded here you will see very typical for the granite pluton these exfoliation joints yeah so exfoliation joints there are two things here to consider one is what i've shown here in this image so basically it's the unloading yeah but also think about this when the pluton cooled yeah so you had magma here that cooled slowly and the magma crystallized into forming granite so when it cools yeah there are basically there is contraction yeah uh, and the contraction can be stronger more yeah more than the country rock yeah so uh, but but because it's a depth there is there is a load on top of it and it doesn't manifest yeah you you but as it gets as it gets the load on top of the pluton gets less and less and less basically these tensile stresses due to contraction create this these uh, surfaces of fracture yeah so these are the processes that lead to this. Now I'm going to show you some example. Here, this is in uh, the state of Texas in uh, the United States. Uh, actually, I visited this. Uh, I took this from the internet, but uh, a long time ago, very long time ago, I can't remember. Probably it was 2003 or something like this. Uh, I went to to this place in Texas and walked and it was pretty interesting yeah i walked on top of this uh pluton that had this exfoliation uh, joints yeah so that's what they look like yeah so so they are real and maybe you've seen these things um now another famous example this is uh, from california in the yosemite uh, national park of california 
also made very famous because of climbers. Climbers go to the Yosemite, where you have this uh, massive granites, yeah, the, these uh, uh, granitic uh, uh, bodies, and they climb them. And uh, they are very famous, all these routes of pl climbing, and uh, from time to time, some of them fall and die, unfortunately, but it happens every year. Uh, so it, uh, uh, as you look at this feature, which is called the half dome, yeah, uh, you can see the exfoliation joints. Yeah, you can see them here uh, all over the place. Yeah. Now look at the at the size of people here. Yeah. So and you can see the exfoliation joints. Quite cool in, in a sense. Yeah. So this is again the result of these processes we discussed. Very typical for granitic plutons. All right, now another example, and this is not granite, yeah, this is uh, sandstone, yeah, uh, this is in Utah, yeah, in the uh, Zion National Park. Um, and what you see here, you see many sets of systematic joints, yeah. So you have uh, definitely you have ones that are horizontal, parallel to the bedding, and these are basically the release joints, the release joints uh, as this layer was exhumed, yeah, but also you have the, some vertical ones, and as this is in 3D, definitely you'll have in one direction and another direction, so all these are systematic joints, yeah, you see them, systematic joints, so they formed due to the thermal contraction that the volume of rock suffered through exhumation, yeah, so this is an example where you can see uh, these different joints uh, affecting this volume of rock. And they are, it says that they are enhanced by weathering, yeah, enhanced. We can see them very nicely because the weathering focuses, yeah, on these uh, fractures. All right. Now, I would say that the most spectacular, most spectacular ones are these ones. Uh, columnar joints, and I do hope that all of you will have the uh, occasion to uh, go and see these type of joints um, in, uh, uh, you know, in real rocks, not just in pictures. So in basaltic igneous bodies, like uh, basaltic lava flows or seals, uh, the seals are horizontal, um, horizontal uh, igneous bodies. Um, they that's where you 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 fi find them and they look like this yeah these columns of uh, basalt uh, and their formation their formation is related to the cooling of the volume of rock so the cooling creates inside the volume of rock creates uh, its contraction and the contraction creates these tensile stresses yeah that basically create this hexagonal sides of fractures and now the fractures get uh, deeper and deeper and deeper advanced with the thermal gradient as the rock volume cools yeah so this is what is explained in this text you will be able to read it but here is a famous example this is from northern ireland but if you uh, if you google columnar joints you can see many images yeah, many images from all over the world of uh, outcrops with columnar joints. But now you can see them. They, they exist. They are very real. Uh, this is not the most spectacular. Some are even more spectacular, but this is very famous, uh, Giant's Causeway. So that's why I included it here. Very famous in the geology textbooks. All right. So now you can see what are the situations. Yeah. Uh, those situations that lead to the formation of joints. Now, we are done with joints. If you have questions, you can ask them now, later, doesn't matter. We are done with joints. Um, and I'm going to move to something not as spectacular as the joints <laughs> uh, that I've shown, but just for you to know. So what we discussed so far, we discussed about uh, rocks that are having low porosity or are non-porous, yeah, and how they respond to stress in the brittle regime, yeah, and they form, uh, they form 
uh, extension fractures like here, or they form shear fractures, yeah, like here. This very sharp, yeah, discontinuities, these uh, planar or these surfaces uh, of discontinuity. Now, what happens, and this is why I put it with a different color, what happens if you have highly porous rocks, sedimentary rocks, yeah? So a sedimentary rock, let, let's say a sandstone, initially it's not a sandstone, it is a sand, and the sand goes, the sediment that we call sand goes through a process of lithification, yeah? So from a sediment, it becomes a sedimentary rock. So from the sand, for instance, it becomes a sandstone. From the silt, which has smaller particles, smaller par particles, it becomes um, a siltstone, yeah? From the mud, for instance, it becomes a mudstone or a, a shale. So the idea is, think about sedimentary rocks in this process, in this uh, spectrum, from unconsolidated or poorly consolidated to a bit more consolidated. So at this limit, for instance, sandstones, they have large porosity and so on. In the case of these rocks, what would be the mechanical response? What would, how would the deformation, the brittle deformation manifest? Yeah. So in the rocks that are kind of strong, yeah, low porosity and so on, this response, yeah, extension fractures, shear fractures. Now, what happens here? What happens here is that the deformation is happening. It's a bit more distributed, yeah? It's not such a sharp discontinuity. It is distributed in a band, yeah, in a band. And you can have something called the, the, the dilation bands. You can see them here. The equivalent of the extension fractures, yeah? Or, or, something called shear bands, yeah, which would be this zone where the de brittle deformation occurred. And it's the equivalent in this type of rocks, highly porous, of the shear fractures. So the, let's, let's look a bit at the shear bands. There is a, there is a, a spectrum, yeah? You, you can imagine uh, now what happens. So for instance, let's say you have a, a relatively poorly consolidated sandstone, yeah? So there is a bit of cement between the sand grains that glues the sand grains, yeah? So it's a, a bit consolidated, but poorly, yeah? So in response to, to stress, yeah, um, what, would be, what would happen with these grains, yeah? W there is a process that we call disaggregation, yeah? Disaggregation. So they are aggregated, yeah? A bit consolidated, and it's disaggregation, yeah? So basically, the the cement, yeah, the cement is uh, basically broken, and the grains can roll, yeah, slide. Some of the um, so the the bonds are are broken. So basically, this is granular flow. Yeah. So that's why this disaggregation band you'll you'll find it in poorly consolidated sandstone. So so this is at the beginning. Now. If you have, if you have uh, phyllosilicates, yeah, phyllosilicates like mica, yeah, like micas, these are platy minerals, and um, where you have more than ten to fifteen percent, yeah, of mica in in this sedimentary rock, what will happen? What will happen? These platy minerals will promote, yeah, they facilitate grain sliding and this platy minerals align align and they form it's called a, a fabric yeah they form a fabric like a texture yeah so they align along this shear uh, band yeah so that's why you might see something called phyllosilicate bands now think now about the situation that you have a more consolidated sandstone, yeah? It's uh, the, the stronger bone, bones and so on. So here the deformation will have to break, it will break some bones, but it will also break some of the grains, yeah? Some of the grains. So you'll have a, a zone, a zone where you have a significant uh, bre uh, breaking of 
the grains. So we talk about cataclysis here, yeah, cataclysis, you remember the term. So it's not only sliding of the grains rolling, it's their breakage. So that's cataclysis. And basically you have this process of cataclysis uh, is happening in the cataclastic band, yeah? So uh, cataclastic band is like this, yeah? It, the zone of brittle deformation in this type of rock. And what happens finally, if you want, there is dissolution and cementation. So the idea is that these rocks are per percolated by fluids. So the fluids will uh, basically dissolve some of, of the cement from one part and will re -precipita precipitate it eventually. So in these zones yeah, of deformation, there will be subsequent precipitation and cementation yeah? as they won't stay like like uh, loose loose zones yeah so and then we can see them yeah we can see them because they are cemented but when it happened when the deformation happened then there was cataclysis yeah so let's look at some examples uh, they are from the textbook yeah but just for you to see, so if you look at the outcrop, so this is with the naked eye, you see sandstone, you see the, the sand grains, they are glued together by cement. In between them, there, there is pore space and so on, yeah? Um, and what happens, this is the characteristic band, yeah? The, the, this zone. And here in this zone, there was subsequent to the deformation, there was precipitation, and you see this whitish, uh, uh, whitish stuff here. So this is cement that was precipitated later, yeah, later after the deformation ended, and it it glues the fragments here in the um, in the this cataclastic band. Now, what happens as a result of this? the pore space, the pore space um, is reduced somehow because you crush the grains so they fit better, yeah, one into another. And if you look with the microscope or something uh, like this, you see very nicely, very, very nicely, the cataclastic band. So what you can see is what the intact sandstone looks like with the pore space, which is colored in blue here, and you see the sand grains, yeah. And here you see the zone of deformation where, where grains initially like this were broken, yeah, were commun comminuted, yeah. They became smaller, smaller, and smaller, and the pore space is less because in between these little fragments, now there is cement, yeah, there is cement. So that's what you see, very nice, yeah. So now you can recognize with a microscope, these zones. Now, with the naked eye in the outcrops, you can see things like this. I, I think this is quite a spectacular example. It is from textbook, but I find it too good not to show it. I mean, why not show it? Yeah, so basically, you see uh, conjugate sets. Yeah, you see conjugate set, sets of cataclastic bands. So the idea is, if this rock were less porous, yeah, were, were a different rock, you would have conjugate fractures. But here, being a sandstone, yeah, uh, the deformation happened in this band, yeah, not, not a longer surface. That's the idea. And because they were cemented afterward, they stick out, you see, they are even more resistant to erosion. So we can see them very nicely. These zones that suffer deformation, it's quite paradoxical. These zones that were mechanically weaker, yeah, at some point in the past, they got cemented and the rock, the fresh rock, yeah, the uh, unaffected rock around them was eroded here. So I think it is spectacular, yeah, because now you can see and you can understand how uh, complex the mechanics is, yeah, and what happens and how the volumes of rock respond to various factors, uh, inside and outside, yeah, that's the idea. All right, now, this, uh, in the textbook, you'll, you'll find these two diagrams, and I think Fossen 
he tried to, to put together a general view, like an idea. Let's imagine what would happen with a volume of this sand that becomes a sandstone, yeah, becomes a sandstone, as it gets buried deeper and deeper and deeper, and then it gets exhumed. So we have a geologic history here. There are processes that this sand is deposited in a sedimentary basin, yeah, and it gets buried and it, be, it, it starts becoming lithified, yeah, and you start transforming the sediment into a sedimentary rock and it suffers deformation. Now, think about this. It gets buried, and here it's not really strongly consolidated. The formation that would suffer here is disaggregation bands. Now, the same rock might have uh, phyllosilicates, might have, yeah? And then here, in, under these conditions of compression and depth, you'd see these phyllosilicate bands. Now the same rock as it, it got consolidated, yeah, and it, it's deeper now, it's deeper. Here, it develops cataclastic bands. So the, the difference between disaggregation and cataclastic is that here, the grains are broken, yeah? There is commun comminution. You've seen what happened to the grains, got broken into small pieces, yeah? So the rock gets buried with geologic time. And as it, is uh, it sustains different st stress situations, it deforms by forming these features, yeah? Now, the geologic situation, you see, so we have disaggregation bands, we have cataclastic bands in the rock. We don't know if we have phyllosilicate bands because it depends if it has phyllosilicates, but there are something between disaggregation bands and cataclastic bands with mica in them, yeah? And then this volume of rock with the evolution of uh, the geologic history, initially was in a sedimentary basin. And then this sedimentary basin and the layers is now the Andes, yeah? It becomes a mountain. <laughs> so this is impressive, yeah? What happens on our planet? So it gets exhumed. And as it gets exhumed, yeah? As it gets exhumed, it develops um, tensile stress because it gets cooler and cooler and cooler, and there is the contraction, uh, yeah? And then you have this type of joints in it. So then you, you go in the field and you look at this rock and you think, well, what happened to this rock? Not all these things happened at the same time. So this is uh, why you are here, why we study this and why you will have a, uh, you know, a degree so that you will be competent to, to be know and understand this history. So I think this is a very nice, uh, a very nice diagram. And another one, maybe a bit more uh, experimental. Yeah, this is more conceptual. This is experimental uh, that Fossen uh, puts here. What would be the situations, yeah, for forma the formation of these um, of these uh, different bands, depending on the phyllosilicate content. So if you have enough phyllosilicate, yeah, you see here, you form the phyllosilicate bands. And this is a field in terms of depth and content of phyllosilicates where you form this. If you have too little, you are not going to see these bands. You are going to see these bands. And Claysmere says the phyllosilicate would not be stable. Yeah, too much of it would not be stable and would basically be converted to clay, yeah, clay minerals. Uh, and, uh, you know, the water is added, it, it penetrates there, and uh, the phyllosilicates become clay, and uh, it's called clay smears, because these zones of the formation will have a lot of clay, and outside them, there is sandstone, yeah? So, I think these are kind of neat diagrams that uh, uh, give you some insight. All right, let's see. We are close to, to finishing. Um, just a few more slides, maybe uh, three or four slides. So bear it with me. We are done with fractures. Now you have an idea about fractures as a, you know, in an introductory course. Now we can move to the next level of complexity and we can start talking about faults. And faults are extremely important. Yeah, extremely important. I mean, 
faults. You heard about them already in the general geology uh, class uh, for sure. This is just as an example, yeah, uh, an example from Utah. You have in, you know, all these images from the United States because a, a lot of textbooks exist, uh, you know, for, come from the United States. And the Western United States being arid has exposed geology. Uh, it's really great. I mean, think about this. If you go to Mexico, yeah, you go to Northern Mexico, there is exposed geology in the same way like in Arizona, like in New Mexico, like in California. Now, at some point in history, all these states were part of Mexico, but they were lost to the United States. Anyway, so this zone being arid exposes geology. Now, if you go to the Yucatan Peninsula or you come to Colombia, there is this wonderful vegetation in Colombia that covers the ground. So you don't have the conditions to expose so well the geology. Yeah? So it, it's a bit more challenging for us. Yeah? So that's why you have a lot of pictures from these zones that are arid. So here, what I want to, to, to show you here is a reverse fault zone. Yeah? Look at this. I think this is spectacular. You can basically correlate this, obviously, correlate this, yeah? this layer here, which is made of several uh, uh, alternances, probably it's shale and sandstone, probably. Yeah, look at this. You can correlate it with this, yeah? And what's on it here with something here, but the deformation is a bit more complex here, yeah? But you can see these correlations. So, uh, Fawson gives uh, in some blog, uh, gives an interpretation, yeah? A different picture, but the same, the same, feature, yeah? And you see the interpretation, you see the uh, that package I was mentioning correlating here, and you see basically why he says that it is a fault zone, yeah? So you can, you can have here a, a discontinuity surface, which is a fault surface, but it's not only this. You have another one here and another one here, and this creates this complexity, yeah? This is a fault zone, you can see it here. So I think it's quite, uh, quite uh, interesting. I think faults are extremely interesting. Yeah, everyone I think would be kind of uh, fascinated by them. And uh, there are things associated with faults, like like earthquakes. Yeah, and earthquakes are a big headache for us as uh, the human society. And um, here, what I'm giving you just in a couple of slides, for you to compare some definitions. Yeah. This is taken from a different textbook that we don't use, but it is an older textbook, but very, very good, but it's a bit dry and more boring. But I think that this paragraph, I want you to read it because it tries to explain, yeah, how you can define a fault. What is a fault? Yeah. Yeah. So obviously there is brittle deformation there. Yeah. So he says it can be a surface or a zone. You see a narrow zone. Yeah, um, and in most cases, we see brittle, brittle fractures, yeah, where we can see zones of closely spaced shear fractures, like many of them, yeah, uh, and we can call it a fault zone, yeah. Now, we have something that we'll discuss later that we call them shear zones when we discuss about ductile deformation, yeah, shear zones. So when we, I say ductile, it means that with our naked eye, yeah, we cannot see the discontinuity, yeah? It's kind of the deformation exists in a zone, but without loss of continuity to our eyes. Now we have to look at the micro scale and see if the deformation was brittle because you have many, many shear fractures there because it was plastic deformation, yeah? So faults cover all this spectrum from one surface, brittle deformation, to a zone of ductile deformation, yeah? And that we call them shear zones, yeah? So that's the idea. Now, if you go to Fawson, he tries to give you, you see, some definitions, yeah? Like surface or narrow zone with visible shear displacement, yeah? 
it says fault is a discontinuity. The displacement is parallel, parallel to this surface of discontinuity. He says dominated by brittle deformation mechanisms. So even if it looks as if it's ductile, in many cases, it, the brittle deformation is dominant. Yeah. So and here is uh, another another um, definition here as a tabular volume of rock. So it can be a surface or a volume of rock. So you have a central slip surface, yeah, what is intense deformation, if you want, or we call, can call it shearing, yeah, uh, and a surrounding volume that was affected a bit, yeah, was affected uh, less and less as you, as you go farther from the, the central uh, fault zone, fault uh, surface, and that we call that the, the damage zone, yeah. We'll learn about this next time. The final slide that I want to show you is exactly what I wanted to point out. This spectrum, yeah? So look at this, this fault uh, as it's represented here. So it says here, three styles of faulting. Here you can see there is a single, a single surface along which the formation occurs, yeah? So movement occurs. So we, this is like a, a single, you know, a single fault surface. Here, here, we can call this a fault zone because as you can see, we have several, several surfaces along which there was shearing, yeah, shearing. And here you get to the other, as we, uh, other end member of the spectrum, is where you have a zone. So we again have a zone, but now you cannot see with your eyes the actual shear surfaces. Yeah, it looks as if it's uh, the formation that is uh, that didn't lead to the uh, loss of uh, cohesiveness. Yeah, cohesion in the rock. But when you look with the microscope, you might see many, many, many. Uh, shear surfaces. Yeah, that's the idea. So we move from fault to ductile shear zones. Now, for the next lecture, we'll focus on this, like fault and fault zones, where we can see the actual brittle, uh, <laughs> uh, brittle features, and we'll have later a discussion on the ductile shear zones. All right. So this is it for today. Please read these sections, as as you see. For instance, here. Uh, 7.5 in this book, read these pages, yeah, which are relevant, yeah. Here, section 8.1, read this page, 152, yeah. If I don't put the page, I mean read the whole section, yeah. But if I put the pages, means read those pages. This is it for today. Uh, muchas gracias a todos. Un feliz fin de semana. Si ustedes tienen preguntas, por favor, dígame. <laughs> Um, voy a detener el uh, partido aquí y muchas gracias. Thank you, teacher. No, you are very welcome, all of you. Thank you, teacher. Bye bye. Uh, yes, uh, you are welcome. You are welcome. Oh, Gabriel disappeared. <laughs> and his weekend. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you, Juan. Thank you, David. David. Thank you, teacher. Thank you, teacher. You're welcome. You're welcome, all of you.